Welcome to the Books on Air podcast. I'm Suzanne Harris, and my listeners get the secret backstory behind every book. Joining me today is Sujata Tiwari. She is here to talk about her very personal and inspirational book, Against All Odds, No Retakes, No Manuals, Real Life Lessons. Sujata, welcome to Books on Air. It's such a pleasure to have you today. Thank you, Susan. It's an honor for being in a talking to you. You know, your book, your story, is very, very personal. Why did you decide and make the courageous decision to share your story in a book? Because, as I have said this in my book, and I've said it often, there are lots and lots of people out there, women, and not only women, men, children, who serve in an abusive, toxic relationship or in a toxic situation. What they do most often is not to come out in the open because our society is built in such a way that there is re-stigmatization and there is no justice most of the time. So they suffer in silence and they put it under the carpet and they don't come out. Because I took the courageous step when lockdown happened and because my journey is so unique where, you know, I even had a spiritual experience, I decided and felt a calling that I must put this book as a legal life manual so that everybody who thinks that they can't do it should get inspired by my story because I was all alone. I have always been alone, but I, it never stopped me or deterred me from taking courageous dis, you know, decisions in life-altering moments. And I want that to be heard by everybody so that they can take the courage and they can come forward. How long did it take you to put the book together? How long did it take you to write it? Oh, I started in lockdown last year in March, actually end of March, when the court case of seven years ended. And there was lockdown in Singapore. And I just started writing. And I wrote every day. I almost became blind. But it was like, you know, pouring the entire story out. And I published the book on Amazon in September. Was it cathartic for you? Was it, did you feel like you were able to get cleansed in some way inside by writing everything down? Yes. Yes. Actually, I will always tell people that never bottle up your feelings. You must express either through journal writing if you don't have somebody to share. And we don't often have people to share because let's face it, people don't care. And so they are not going to actually be bothered about you. And uh, so you can do journal writing. If you are blessed and fortunate to have a friend, share it with the friend. And if nothing else, then share it with the world. You can always put it out in the open and it's for discerning individuals to take up your story and to, you know, take inspiration, guidance, or whatever. And in the process, you will be lighter. It's like crying. When grief and bereavement happen, the ones who probably deal with it uh, easier and faster are those who can cry. And those who bottle it up, get choked on the tears, take a longer time in healing, especially men who are taught not to cry. Oh, that's put so eloquently. You just you have such a wonderful way with words, and I couldn't agree with you more. I have read so much about the power of journaling, and there are so many ways that you can do that. And I think if there's no one that you feel that you can open up to, that it is so important to at least sit down and begin to write about the events, begin to write about your feelings, begin to let things out, even if it's only on paper. You're right. Bottling things up is not healthy. Sujata, did you learn anything new about yourself from writing the book? Uh, 
not exactly because uh, i have always as a child been writing and uh, reading and writing is what we grew up with and since i was a journalist earlier so i guess writing was not very difficult for me uh, versus people you know who have to write such sensitive matters even for journaling right, right. but since i have been writing since i was a journalist since i did all kinds of uh, jobs where i had to write uh, like as an investigator you have to write reports and you have to write you know something very sensitive which is only for somebody's eyes who's given you a task and you have to deal with writing i think was not so difficult for me um as far as learning i think i discover every time that i do something outside the ordinary i discover some aspect of me which tells me that i have a lot of courage and resilience that is something which constantly comes up in my action oh i love that and it shows in the book let's give our listeners just an overview of your story in the book so shall i tell what the whole book is all about just an overview just so they have an idea of what your story is okay. so basically my story is about a single woman's journey of courage and resilience because like i say when you have nothing absolutely nothing you have the one thing within you and that is your courage and you have if you believe in doing the right thing then you will just draw upon your courage and doors will open and that is what i have found so growing up in a country like india where you have to face all kinds of challenges especially as a woman i went through it all i went through you know like losing my father at 10 being brought up by my widowed mother who taught us very sound principles that's why i am what i am because of her and then you know if you don't get a manual to be a perfect woman perfect wife mother and also i you know did uh, i became a daughter in law against the wishes of the family i you know I became a career woman and all the time the society told me you can't do it from a housewife to fashioning a career without any resume without any certificate that has been my journey uh, or if you take the example that where i was a housewife and i was stalked by a mafia don how did i do how did i handle those situations as i say leadership is not about the designations it's about decisions that one takes so setting up business and foreign shows handling the rape case um having a spiritual experience i think except for being uh, murdered myself and you know far worse i've almost faced everything and i've always relied on my courage so i wanted this book as a legal life manual and that's what is the story all about it's an incredible story about one single woman who was totally alone at every step but i just relied on my courage and confidence is there a part of the book that you would like to read to our listeners yes because uh this part of the book actually captures the essence of the whole book you know it's the title of the book right So if you just bear with me I can read it out. Perfect. I had to hire a car for the whole day. Initially I chose different cars so as not to leave trails as much as possible for the security guards who were spying on our movements. The first day it started with lightning. Uh I must uh, tell a bit because people may not understand you know since i'm reading a part so i have two daughters and one of them was is the survivor and the other is the sister and uh, both of them were prosecution witness i have of course changed names to protect the identity so i will start with the survivor who is called lightning it started with lightning and we left early in the morning 
for the one and a half journey to the other end of the town where the court was from where we stayed. Lightning was nervous as hell. We reached early. There is a board outside the courtroom with listings of serial numbers to be heard for the day. Ironically, kindness and compassion are not gender specific. From day one, I was targeted as the main point by the defense lawyer. Webha was delayed and a number came up. Serial number called out the clerk. Since I was to be a witness, which somehow the defense knew, it was strongly opposed of my sitting in an adjoining room. The lady judge was equally firm and said I would be allowed in her court. So I was permitted to sit in the adjoining room. Lightning was in tears once the question started, firing like bullets. She tried to say she would like to wait for a lawyer. No one, especially a rape victim, can be prepared for what happens in the witness box. The judge said kindly, I will take care, just answer the defense lawyer question. But the worst was that the rapist, the accused, was sitting there. What kind of laws do we have where you are to be in the presence of your attacker and go over the incident? In front of him, you have to talk of bite mark, genital pain, and answer questions on your character. She didn't remember that night, but knew now. So this time it was public rape and you have to be aware and picture what this man had done to you and not say a word. And then you have to hear from society to move on. Really? Bagade came in, but there was another lady, the assistant public prosecutor who was speaking for Bagade. Her name I was to learn later was Nilima Kasturi. Bagade came and lightning looked beseechingly at him. I was carved in stone and ice cold. I could only think of the perpetrator in the next room. Lightning gave her testimony in tears. She was PW1, which means prosecution witness number one. Three of us born with names were christened again with given names, PW1, PW2, and for me, I have a new name, PW12. It takes almost a day, and at the end, we went home. There are no decent restrooms, and during lunch break, we had to look for a nearby cafe to eat just for using the restroom. My serious ill health started. Even though I didn't eat throughout the whole day, my sugar levels were soaring sky high. There was chest pain, and what I thought was bleeding was actually stool incontinence, staining my panties. It was day one. Day two, it was PW2, Lotus, who was to take a stand. She is the fiery one, and I had to caution her to be polite but firm and not lose her cool, or be rattled or sidetracked, as that would be to the advantage of the defense. She had to repeat everything. Basically, both daughters had to literally undress and be naked in front of the perpetrator and let him gloat internally and relive his pleasures. For the next three months, except for weekends, I was to hire a car every day and I would go in the same clothes. They were washed only on the weekend. I would go early when the doors were opened and the sweepers came to clean the courtroom and tidy up. There were piles and piles of files dotting the floor on the sides of the room. On the judge's table and the table where the prosecution sat were thick, heavy books of law. When the judge walked in while passing through to her chambers, she saw me sitting like a statue in a corner. I also went early so I would have a place to sit. As in an open court, there are many troubled souls who come and a whole horde of lawyers and sometimes journalists come and go to. Webha assured me that the girls had finished their testimony and maybe lightning may have to come one more time later. But as of now, they were not required. But I was going every day. There were 24 witnesses, and some of them I couldn't sit and observe as I had yet to testify. And so it was a joining room. The staff were all kind with their looks as we never spoke. And as days went by, I was to become a familiar figure. People would identify me later by my uniform dress as the rape victim mother. Finally, it was my turn, and I had carried all the tapes that I had collected, all the evidence and documents that were needed, as I was fast learning and determined that I should not be caught napping. This was my only chance to be heard. 
Strangely, when my turn came, the defense lawyer made a motion to not have 